L'Hopital's rule is going to be the focus of this video, which is going to have us go back to limits. And I know you're probably uh, not super happy about that because a lot of people don't like limits. I do. I think limits are really nice and easy. But uh, when we did limits at the beginning of the year, right, we always would try to direct evaluate, which would mean, hey, just, just try to plug it in, right? As that X value is approaching something in particular, uh, we could always just try to plug it in. And then if, if we got an answer, well, that was wonderful, right? That's, that's the answer. Uh, the problem was when we tried to direct evaluate, when we got something like zero over zero, or when we got something like infinity over infinity, uh, those were called indeterminate forms. And those answers, whenever we get them from a limit, that doesn't mean does not exist. It doesn't mean there is no answer. It means we cannot determine what the answer is. And so we had a collection of different strategies, right? Algebraic strategies that we could use to try to skate around and figure out what the answers to those indeterminate limits were. We could factor and reduce. We could, if we had multiple fractions, we could try to combine them and simplify using our fraction tricks. Uh, we could try to use the conjugate trick. Uh, if we have some special trig limits like sine x over x, we know that limit was one, as is the reciprocal. We also know that one minus cosine x over x, that limit was zero as x goes to zero. Uh, and there's more, right? We had probably about six or seven or eight different strategies. We had the limits to infinity, where we focused on the biggest terms and then ignored everything else. We had the limits to zero, where we focused on the smallest term. Right? We had probably at least half a dozen or so algebraic and pre-cal trig strategies that we could use to dance around and figure out those indeterminate forms. What's nice about uh, calculus is there's one rule that's going to basically overwrite and supersede all of those previous techniques. And that one rule is called L'Hopital's rule. Now, just based on the different spellings, you may see it. Uh, you may see it with the little S right there. So maybe like hospitals or, or Hopital. Uh, it's pronounced L'Hopital. Uh, there, there could be an S right there after the O, but if it's not there, that's okay. It's just two different ways of spelling the same thing. Uh, but there's this guy L'Hopital, and his his name got attributed to this little calculus rule, and it's going to help us deal with those specific indeterminate forms, right? Uh, so L'Hopital's rule is the goal of this lesson. It's a really nice, really easy rule, but before we get into it, let's try to do just some investigation. So if you had a calculator, uh, what we would be doing for these notes is you would just take this and you would type that into your calculator, like Y1. And then we're trying to see like, what happens with that function as the X values get closer and closer and closer to zero. Uh, if I plugged in zero, you would get e to the zero minus one over zero, so you'd get one minus one. Uh, so if I were to try to direct evaluate it, we would get that zero over zero indeterminate form. Now, that doesn't mean does not exist, right? That doesn't mean there's not going to be an answer. It means we don't know what the answer is right off the bat. Uh, so we could have tried to do one of those strategies, but really uh, nothing, nothing that we had learned first semester now. Okay, so what we could do is make a table, or we could look at the graph, or algebraically, we could just take these values, right, this is really doing a table, we could just pick values, and then as those x values get closer and closer and closer to my target destination of zero, we're going to look to see if there's any type of pattern or trend in the corresponding y values. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to plug in 0.1, which is pretty close to zero. We're going to see what the y value is. Uh, but then we're going to make the x value closer to zero and see what the y value is. Then we'll get even closer still to zero, right? We're going to see what happens as I approach zero. Now, 0.1 would be on the right side. 0 0.01 would also be on the right, as would 0 0.001, right? So these values are going to be like the limit from the right. If there's any pattern in where those y values are taking you towards, that would be like our limit from the right. I start on the right side, but then I'm approaching my target value from that right side. And then we do the same thing, but from the left. So we're going to try to look at, is there a limit from the right? Is there a limit from the left? And hopefully those two things are going to be true, because that overall limit will not exist unless the right side and the left side are the same. So if you were to type that into Y1, you could then go to the table and evaluate it. We'd have to change the table so that you ask for the independent, or you could just plug everything in from the home screen. But if you were to take that function, 
let me clear all this stuff. If you were to take that function and then evaluate it with all of these different x numbers, uh, here are the values you get. If I plugged in 0.1, you would get 3.4985880076. Sorry, it takes me a little bit to look at the paper and then copy it. So if I plugged in something pretty close to 0, 0.1, you get a value that's pretty close to 3.5, it looks like. Uh, but we need to get closer to zero to see if there's if there's any more definitive pattern. If I plug in 0 0.01, we would get 3.045, and then it's 4.53395. Okay, so my x value got closer to zero. My y value ooh, looks like it's getting closer to three. Let's see what happens. As I make the x value even closer to zero, what happens? Well, the y value is going to get even closer to 3. It's 3.00450 and then, uh, yeah, 4503. So we can see as those x values are getting closer to 0, but on the right side, it uh, looks like those y values are also going to get closer to 3. Right? So here it looks like our limit from the right seems like it's 3. As the x values from the right side get closer to 0, the y values from that right side are getting closer to 3. Let's see what happens from the left. If I were to plug in uh, negative 0.1, you would get 2.5918177. Uh, and if I were to get closer, so I get a little bit closer to zero. This is, this is approaching from the left. But if I were to get closer, it's 2.9554466645. And then if I were to get even closer still, I would get 2.99. Five five zero four four nine seven. So it looks like there's some symmetry involved from the right and from the left. But clearly, right, as my x values from here to here and from here to here, as my x values get closer to zero, it also looks like that limit, those y values, are getting closer and closer to three. Now these x values were on the right side of zero, but getting closer. These were on the left side. So we had the limit from the left was three, the limit from the right was three. So what do we think this overall limit is? Three, right? This three, this limit of that function is going to be three. Now remember, if we tried to direct evaluate, we got zero over zero. So that was indeterminate. We ended up getting an answer. That zero over zero ended up being three, but we just couldn't determine it by direct evaluating. Uh, so we could have made a table. We could also look at a graph. Uh, that, that, that function would be undefined. There's a hole, but the hole would be at a height of three. Right? So we basically just kind of numerically investigated what that limit is by plugging in different x values and seeing what the patterns and the y values were. The pattern from the left and the pattern from the right, they both matched, and those y values were getting closer to 3 from both sides. Right, so that limit would be 3. We know it. right? There wasn't really an algebraic strategy that we could have done, but we could have just looked at the table and gotten it all done. Okay, let's look at the next couple of examples, which are going to be pretty much the same idea, except just two different, uh, two different functions. Right, so now I could type in this thing. Uh, into y1, and then we could investigate it as that thing gets closer and closer and closer to 1. Uh, now, if I plugged in 1 for x, you would get some undefined issues, uh, but, but so you, you, would, you wouldn't really know what the answer is right off the bat, but if we investigated it by plugging in values, uh, we would end up getting 0.492059, and then if I plugged in something a little bit closer to 1, now this is only from the right side, right? It's on the right side, then it's closer to one, but still on the right, then closer. You're only approaching one from the right side. That's what the little plus signifies. So if I plugged in something, it's pretty close to one, you get something pretty close to 0.5. If I get closer to one, now this result is going to be closer to 0.5. It's 0.499171. Then if I get even closer to one, the y values are 0.4999. One seven. So we can see as those x values are getting closer and closer and closer uh, to, uh, to 1, those y values from the right are going to be getting closer and closer and closer to 0 0.5, aka 1 half. Same thing here. We could type this one into y1, and then we could evaluate it. Uh, and here we're just looking. As the x values get really big, right, as they trend towards infinity, well, if I plugged in 100, uh, we would get 7. Point Two four four six. So that's terrible. It's four four six uh, four six. And then this one, if I plugged in a uh, thousand, so the x value definitely bigger. Seven point three seven four 
312. And then this last one, if I were to plug in something, we would get 7.387. Uh, and that one, you can tell there, there definitely is some limit, right? Because I changed it from 100 to 1,000. That's moving pretty far down on your x-axis. And then you change it from 1,000 to 10,000. That's, that's going pretty far to the right on your graph. And, and those y values, they don't really change a whole heck of a lot, right? So my x values, as they trend towards the right, as they get bigger, the y values seem to be capped by some 7.3 and change value, right? We can tell that there's definitely some limiting factor. They're, they're not going to go up to like infinity. It looks like they may not even get up to 7.5. Uh, now, the actual value for this ends up being e squared. Remember, e is a constant, about 2.7, uh, but that value, e squared, uh, that is what it's trending towards. That's the number that's about 7.38, whatever, whatever, whatever. We're going to prove that in just a little bit in one of the examples. But the idea for these limits is that when you plug it in, sometimes you just can't get the answer because it's indeterminate. We've seen 0 over 0 and infinity over infinities before, and we're going to actually encounter more types of indeterminate forms. That's what this example 2 and this example 3 would be. They're also indeterminate, but there are kind of some of the uglier uh, less less friendly indeterminate forms, but we could still find what those limit values are by plugging and chugging and just manually checking as my x values get closer to my target, what happens with the corresponding y's? Is there any type of a pattern? But there's a way to actually do them mathematically besides just plugging and chugging. And even though we don't have an, an algebra strategy that would work for these, uh, we do have the calculus strategy. Right, so L'Hopital's rule is kind of what's going to be helping us a whole lot today. Let's kind of review some of these algebraic techniques. Okay, so earlier in the year, uh, we, we learned some of these algebraic techniques. We kind of talked about them. I actually want to, I actually want to keep this on the screen really quick because I don't want to have to erase it and then move. Okay, so there we are. I'm going to keep the theorem or the rule on the bottom and then we'll go through these examples. Now, let's do them algebraically and then we'll learn the rule and then we'll redo them with the calculus rule. That's, that's called the control theorem. So here we go. Uh, let's do the first one. If I tried to direct evaluate, if I plugged in negative 1 for x, you would end up getting 0 over 0. Which remember, that's indeterminate. It doesn't mean there's not an answer. It means you cannot determine what it is by simply plugging it in. Okay, so what we could do on this first one is factor and simplify. So I could have the limit as x is approaching negative 1. You have a 2 that would factor out, and you have x squared minus 1. Uh, that factors even farther, so that's x plus 1 x minus 1, and then we will have that x plus 1 chunk that reduces. So this one, once you factor it and once you reduce it, it will end up giving you uh, the, just the 2 and then the x minus 1. That's what's left over. Part of it on the bottom cancels with part of it on the top. And then once you reduce it, right, the goal would be to direct evaluate. So then I would take this and I would plug it in. Negative 1 minus 1 would be negative 2. 2 times negative 2 looks like that answer would be negative 4. Okay, so factor in reducing. That's, that's a strategy we used quite a bit. Uh, let's look at the next one. The next one is a limit to infinity. Remember, the limits to infinity, if you were to plug it in, well, here, very obviously, it would be infinity over infinity. But the strategy for these limits to infinity, uh, you could either divide everything by the biggest term, uh, or we could just find the single biggest term on the top, single biggest term on the bottom, and then we could work only with those two things. All right, so here we go. Uh, I have an x squared that will cancel, an x squared that would cancel, and then the limit as x approaches infinity, uh, 3 halves. Well, that's just 3 halves. Uh, that's pretty easy. Or you could have also thought about your uh, horizontal asymptote rules. The degree on the top is 2, the degree on the bottom is 2, and the degrees are the same, right? The hort, that, that limit as x is approaching 0, that's like the right-sided end behavior. All right, so that's asking, what is the graph doing as it goes to the right? And for rational functions, we know the horizontal asymptote tells us that end behavior. So you could do it the long way, dividing everything by x squared, and say, hey, the x is on the bottom, give you infinities on the bottom, and if you divide by infinity, that term goes to 0. You could do it the long way, you don't have to. You also do it this middle way, which is when you, uh, you just find the biggest terms on each layer, then you just reduce them as much as you can, yeah, bam, there it is. Or if you remember your horizontal asymptote rules, you can use those. We had a couple of different ways to do the limits to infinity. 
correspondingly, we had a couple different ways to do the limits to zero. Uh, but, but yeah, we had all those different algebraic techniques. That's great. Lopi told you we're going to basically make them obsolete. And let's look at this third one, which we would use the, the, the trick of the conjugate. If you tried to plug it in, 7 plus 2 would be 9. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. 7 minus 0. Okay, so if I tried to direct evaluate, we would get that indeterminate form. Okay, that's annoying, but it's okay. If I uh, wanted to do it algebraically, what I would do is I would take this and I would multiply by the conjugate. So root of x plus 2 plus 3, root of x plus 2 plus 3, right? You're using the conjugate of the ugly term, right? So you're using the conjugate of the radical. Anytime you had a radical plus or minus a number, uh, the conjugate was always that technique that we wanted to use. All right, so here we go. We're using that conjugate to end up uh, helping us reduce and simplify. Now, I still have the limit as x is approaching 7. Now, remember, the two things that are not conjugates, which for us are the two terms in the denominators, the non-conjugates, you're going to leave them factored. So here I've got x minus 7, then I've got the root of x plus 2 plus 3. I'm going to leave the non-conjugates factored. Do not multiply them out. But the two things that are conjugates, which here are, are the two chunks in the top, I will multiply. The root of x plus 2 times the root of x plus 2, that's just going to be x plus 2. Then I'd have the root of x plus 2 times 3, so I'd have plus 3 roots. Then I'm going to have minus 3 roots. What's nice is when we multiply conjugates, those middle two terms are going to cancel. Right? Always. That's, that's why we like conjugates. right? Hopefully you remember that from, from all the stuff we did first semester. Uh, and then I would need to do the last times last. Negative 3 times positive 3, that's negative 9. That's a terrible 9. I don't like it. Uh, negative 9. Oh, no, and I don't want to move it. No, stop it. What are you doing? I don't remember where it was. Whatever. It's probably close enough. Negative 9. I don't remember where that line was. Oh, well. I guess it doesn't really matter. Okay, so, so yeah, there we have it, right? Uh, we, we, we multiplied out the conjugates, left the non-conjugate simplified, but let's look at the top. We had x plus 2 minus 9. Plus 2 minus 9, uh, that's all the same thing as x minus 7. And then look, lo and behold, the x minus 7 chunk is going to reduce with that x minus 7 chunk. So then we would end up having the limit still as x is approaching 7. Now it reduces and you have a 1 on the top, and I still have the root of x plus 2 plus 3 on the bottom. And then once you've used that conjugate, once you've simplified it and you've reduced it, uh, then we could have direct evaluate. So now I would take the 7, plug it in for x. 7 plus 2 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So you'd have 1 over 3 plus 3. So we would get that this answer is 1 sixth. And there are other strategies and techniques and stuff that we learned first semester. But what's nice is that they're, they're all going to be obsolete once we learn what we told you. Lopi Tolls rule will cover all the factor and reduce, and it will cover your, your limits to infinity and your limits to zero, and it will cover uh, your limits uh, that you use the conjugate or that you combine fractions or that you use the special trig formulas, right? Anything that ends up giving you one of these two indeterminate forms, right? Anything that ends up giving you zero over zero or infinity over infinity, Lopi Tolls rule will solve for you. And L'Hopital's rule is a very nice, very easy rule. Okay, let's read it. It says L'Hopital's rule. If I have a limit where I have a quotient, right, I have some, some fraction, f over g, if that limit results in one of those two indeterminate forms, then the limit of that function is actually the same as the limit of the two respective derivatives also in that division, right? So if I have f over g, the limit of it will be the same as the limit of f prime over g prime. So what does it mean, right? What do I have to do for L'Hopital's rule? I take a derivative on the top, I take a derivative on the bottom, and the ratio of those derivatives is going to give you the same limit value as the ratio of the original functions. Here's an interesting proof, right? If, you, if you're curious, just go YouTube it, right? Proof of L'Hopital's rule. I'm not going to go for it because this video is already going to be long. Uh, but L'Hopital's rule, it's a really nice, really easy rule. If you have one of those two indeterminate forms, you can use L'Hopital's rule, take the derivative on the top, that stays on the top, take the derivative on the bottom, that stays on the bottom, and then that limit of the derivatives is going to give you the same value as the limit of the originals. 
Uh, so let's let's go through it. And let's let's go back and do those three examples, but now let's do them with load control rule. Now, what's important is that every single time you use load control rule, you need to confirm that it's eligible to use load control rule. Right? It must be zero over zero or infinity over infinity. If it's not, uh, then you can't use the rule. Okay, so you have to check that it's one of those two forms. Yes, all three of those uh, were eligible to use low control rule. So now we could go through and do it. All right, let's let's kind of take it over here. So I'm going to use low control rule. I'm still going to have the same limit. So it's the limit as x is approaching negative one. But what I would do is I would take the derivative on the top, which would be 4x, and then I would take the derivative on the bottom, which would just be one. And then look, right, after I've taken the derivatives, now I could direct evaluate it. If I take this and I plug it in for the x, you'll have 4 times negative 1 over 1. And look at that. L'Hopital's rule gives us the answer as negative 4. And that's the same that we had gotten doing it the, the algebraic way. Uh, let's look at the next one. Right here, uh, we got the infinity over infinity. So we could use L'Hopital's rule which means I'm going to keep that same limit, but I would just take the derivative on the top, take the derivative on the bottom, and then, then we would try. The derivative on the top would be 6x. Derivative on the bottom would be 4x. If you wanted to, you could reduce those right now, and then the limit of 6 over 4 would be 6 over 4, aka if you asked. Or if you thought about it, if I tried to evaluate it, it's still infinity over infinity, so that's still an indeterminate form. You could just use L'Hopital's rule again. Uh, you could evaluate it, could reduce the x and then evaluate it, but you could also just keep using L'Hopital rule until it works. All right, so if I took the derivative again, I'd still have the limit as x is going towards infinity, the derivative of 6x is 6, the derivative of 4x is 4, that limit is 6 fourths, which, look at that, it's going to give us the 3 over 2. All right, so L'Hopital rule gave us the same answer as the algebraic way. Let's look at the radical. It was L'Hopital eligible since it was 0 over 0. So let's take the derivatives on both layers and then let's, uh, let's use L'Hopital's rule. Here I'm going to kind of just get rid of this stuff really quick so we have room. The derivative on the bottom is 1. Okay, so I, I'm not even going to write it. Right? How, about, how about that? Right? The derivative on the bottom is 1. I'm not going to write it. But the derivative of the square root, remember the square root, when you take a derivative, is always 1 over 2 of the root. Whatever's inside, copies inside. Chain rule goes to top. You should know that by now, hopefully. But here I've got the radical uh, of x plus 2. So the derivative would be 1 over 2 roots of x plus 2. The derivative of the negative 3 doesn't matter. Chain rule doesn't matter because the derivative of x is 1. So there's my derivative. Right? Really, L'Hopital's rule says the derivative of the top stays on the top. The derivative on the bottom uh, stays on the bottom. Uh, but really, we didn't have to write over 1, which is why I got rid of it. But I took the derivative on the top took the derivative on the bottom, and now let's see if I evaluate, right? If I then took the 7 and then plugged it in, uh, 7 plus 2 would be 9, square root of 9 is 3, 2 times 3, we get 1 sixth. And does that match uh, the thing that we had gotten earlier? Yes. All right, so all those different algebraic strategies, like they're neat, and it's kind of cool how we have all those different strategies, but really they're obsolete and you don't need them, because once we learn L'Hopital's rule, L'Hopital's rule is like the one rule that, that kind of takes care of everything, right? You can use that one rule in all those other situations. You don't have to worry about which different technique you use. L'Hopital's rule is like the blanket coverall. As long as you're 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, L'Hopital's rule will get you the right answer. Right? So it's very, very, very nice. Now notice, when I have this quotient, f over g, I don't have to do, chain, I don't have to do quotient rule. I don't have to do f prime g minus g prime f over g squared. I don't have to do that. All I need to do is much easier. The derivative of the top stays on the top. The derivative of the bottom stays on the bottom. You do not need to do quotient rule. Right? You're just taking the derivative of the top. That piece stays on the top. And then you take the derivative of the bottom. It stays on the bottom. It's a really, really, really good rule. Right? And it basically makes all of our limit questions. That you're going to see on the EP exam. It makes them really pretty easy, right? There's occasionally some hard ones. But let's kind of think about all the stuff we could see with limits. You could see limits from a graph, which should be easy. You could see limits from a table, which should be easy. 
you could see limits algebraically, which will either direct evaluate or will be an indeterminate form. But if it's indeterminate, you can just use L'Hopital's rule, and that should also be easy. Really, limit questions are rarely ever very challenging. Sometimes they word them a little bit sneakily, but limit questions should be pretty gettable. Right? L'Hopital's rule is kind of like uh, the, the cure-all for all of those all of those different strategies. You don't need all the strategies. The one calculus strategy basically makes everything else obsolete. Okay, let's practice a little bit more, and then we'll get into some slightly harder stuff. All right, you know, you know, there's going to be hard stuff. It's not all just going to be uh, like butterflies and kisses and rainbows, right? There's going to be some hard stuff too. All right, let's look at this rule and let's apply it. All right, here's going to. This is one of the examples we did at the beginning, right? The e to the three x minus one of x, and we were investigating that x went to zero. This was the one that we had plugged in chart to investigate. And remember, when we did this in the warm-up, kind of on that first page, we ended up getting three, right? The values from both sides were approaching three. Let's see if L'Hopital's rule can confirm it for us. If I tried to evaluate, I would get zero over zero, which means I can use, oops, I can use L'Hopital's rule. Always to like write the little LH or write out L'Hopital's rule. Uh, write a little thing that indicating like, hey, I, I know it's eligible. Right? It's one of my nice indeterminate forms. There's going to be uglier indeterminate forms, uh, but it's one of those nice ones, so I can use L'Hopital's rule. When you do it, just write L'Hopital's rule or write the little LH. That's just, I don't know, pretty good notation, I think. All right, so let's go take the derivative of the top. It would be 3e to the 3x, and then the derivative of the bottom, right, the minus 1 goes away. So there's my expression after I take the derivative of each layer. The one on the bottom doesn't matter. Let's plug it in. 3e to the 3 times 0. Our, oh, our human over 1, right? doesn't matter. e to the 0 is 1. 3 times 1. Look, you get the same thing. Okay, so, uh, so yes, when we had done it earlier by just plugging and chugging, or if you were looking at the graph, the hole would be at a height of 3. Or if you're looking at the table, both of those values from the left and the right, they were converging towards 3. But you could also do it kind of mathematically with L'Hopital's rule. And that would, that would prove that the answer is 3. Okay, let's look at this one. Uh, here we go. Let's try to plug it in. Obviously, negative infinity, if I took negative infinity squared, the negative doesn't matter, that's going to be infinity. Okay, and then if I had e to the negative, x, all right, and if I took the negative infinity and plugged it in, uh, I have e to the infinity, which is infinity. Okay, so if I were to evaluate it, I would get infinity over infinity. So it is eligible to have L'Hopital's rule done to it. So let's go for it. We're going to take the limit still as x is approaching. Do not change the limit. Right? We're just changing the ratio of those things for which the limit is being applied. We have the original functions. Now we're going to take their derivatives. 2x on the top, and then it would be negative e to the negative x on the bottom. If I tried to plug it in here, 2 times negative infinity would be negative infinity. Remember, negative e to the negative, negative infinity. All of this is infinity, so therefore I would get a negative infinity. Is negative infinity over negative infinity, is that also an indeterminate form? Well, yes, because if you have negative over negative, the two negatives cancel, and then, oh, whoop, you're back at that one. All right, so negative infinity over negative infinity, that's also a good one because the two negatives just cancel. Uh, so here it's not quite ready for the answer, but I can just use L'Hopital's rule again. Sometimes you have to use L'Hopital's rule twice or three times or however many times you need to until one of the layers is a number. Right? Let's take this derivative one more time, and I think we'll be okay. Here we got the derivative of 2x. I still have the same limit. Still as x is going towards negative infinity, the derivative of 2x is 2. The derivative on the bottom, it's going to kick out another negative. So I'm going to have just e to the negative x. Kick out another negative because of the chain rule, so it's back to what it started as. Now if I were to evaluate it, I'm going to get 2 over infinity. And remember, if my denominator gets really, really, really big, the fraction overall is going to get really, really, really small. So that limit ends up being 0. Right? But you needed L'Hopital's rule to prove it. It was indeterminate at first, but it ended up being 0. Okay, so that's kind of a, a good little summary for us. Let's quickly recap something that I probably should have done at the beginning. Uh, let's kind of just re briefly recap stuff. Uh, if I have something like a number over a number, well, that's okay, right? That's going to give you a number. That's easy. Or if I have uh, zero over a number, 
That's, that's okay, that's zero, right? Or if I have an infinity over a number, it could be positive or negative, that's okay. Uh, that's just going to be infinity. It could be positive or negative, right? Just to, based on those ratios, that could be a positive ratio or negative. It depends on whether it was a positive infinity, a positive negative number, or vice versa. But if I have uh, a number on the bottom, you're going to get an answer, okay? If you have uh, a number over zero or a number over infinity, Right, we'll see what happens. Remember, we don't really want to divide by zero, but this is a limit. So that's not technically zero. It's just something that gets really, really, really close uh, to, to, to zero. Or here, that, that's getting really, really, really big. And let's think about it, right? If your denominator gets really, really, really big, the fraction overall is going to get really, really, really small. Okay, and if you have a number divided by infinity, uh, or negative infinity, it doesn't really matter whether it's a plus or minus because it's zero, but if you have a number on top and an infinity or negative on the bottom, that fraction is going to go to zero because if your denominator gets big, the fraction overall gets small. And then vice versa, if your denominator gets small, the fraction overall is going to get really, really, really big. And it could get big in the positive direction or the negative direction just based on the ratio of those two. Right. Which sign is the number, plus or minus? And then are you approaching zero from the negative side? So is it like a negative zero, or are you approaching the zero from the top for, with, the, with positive values? Right. If your denominator gets big, fraction gets small. So an infinity on the bottom gives you a zero as an output, or if your denominator gets small, fraction overall gets big. You just have to worry about the plus or the minus. But as long as one of the layers is a number, right? if they're both numbers easy, or if the bottom is a number, easy. The top is a number, easy. The issue is when we get zeros on both or when we get infinities on both, right? Those were the indeterminate forms. As long as one of the layers is a number, you get the answer. It's when they're both zeros or whenever they're both uh, infinities. That's when they were indeterminate. That's when now we can use those tools. But zero over zero and infinity over infinity, those actually aren't the only two indeterminate forms. Those are really the nicest indeterminate forms, right? There are more, and those other ones, uh, some of them are, are less of a pain than others. Uh, some of them are going to be a little bit gruesome, right? But we've got three more examples, and they're going to be kind of typical for how we could deal with these other indeterminate forms. These are the nice indeterminate forms, because we could use L'Hopital's rule for them. The other indeterminate forms are not as nice. But here we go. We have zero times infinity. That is an indeterminate form. We're going to have a strategy to deal with it, and that zero times infinity, I don't remember which one's which, uh, but that, that first case, that first example is going to tie back uh, to zero times infinity. The, the order for the uh, multiplication needs to be zero, right? If it's infinity times zero, that's the same thing. Uh, and then we have uh, another indeterminate. Uh, we have infinity minus infinity. We don't necessarily know whether that's zero or whether that's something else. Right? We, we don't know. It's indeterminate. We can't tell what the answer is. Like, uh, the zero times infinity, this is like kind of like the immovable force uh, or the, the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. Like, does the zero win or does the infinity win? Which, which one? Uh, or the infinity minus infinity. Which one's bigger? Like, what happens? I don't, like, we don't know. We have to use some other strategies to figure it out. Right? They're indeterminate because at first glance, you just cannot tell uh, what those answers are. Uh, but those are two other indeterminate forms, and there's three more. There's infinity to the zero power. There is uh, one to the infinity power. And then there's zero to the zero power. All three of these are going to be like the example on the next page. And those are going to be harder. The ones that are exponential-ish, so the ones that have a base and an exponent like 0 to the 0 or 1 to the infinity or infinity to the 0, those are going to be more complicated. And we're going to get to those in just a minute. Uh, but we're going to deal with these first two examples first. One of them will be like this first case, 0 times infinity. The other one will be the infinity minus infinity. Right? But those, we, we have five kind of nastier indeterminate forms, and we have a strategy to deal with Let's go through and do these three examples, and then we'll be done. Let's look at this first one. So here we go. If I tried to evaluate, I would have e to the negative infinity uh, times the square root of infinity, right? So that's infinity. e to the negative infinity is uh, 
1 over e to the infinity, which is 1 over infinity, which is 0. Right? So that's all 0. So that is my 0 times infinity case. Right? It doesn't really matter which one comes first. But the strategy for dealing with this, right, whenever I have the 0 times the infinity, if I have multiplication, the strategy for this is to just rewrite it as division. 0 and infinity are kind of like reciprocals. They're not, really, uh, but in the context of a limit question, they behave like reciprocals. So what I'm going to do is instead of having this multiplication, I'm going to take the reciprocal of 1. Now, if I take the reciprocal of this term, you'll end up with infinity over infinity. Or if I take the reciprocal of that term, right, if I flip it and divide by it, uh, you'd end up with the 0 over 0. Right? But the strategy for uh, this particular form of indeterminateness. Right? If I have a 0 times infinity, which I do here, is we're going to rewrite it as division, and then we'll use limits on flip. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to still have this same limit as x is approaching infinity, uh, but instead of multiplication, I'm going to rewrite it. And I'm going to rewrite it by just taking this and moving it to the bottom. Uh, I haven't changed the expression. Right? I just changed how it looked. With the negative exponent, you could just put it on the bottom. So really, I took this term, and I did the reciprocal of it, and I put it on the bottom. Okay, the reciprocal of 0 is infinity, so now instead of having uh, 0 over 0, now I'm going to have, if you were to plug it in, the infinity over infinity. All right, and now that I've taken that and I've rewritten it as division, now I can use L'Hopital's rule. All right, so let's go for it. I'm still going to have the limit as x is approaching infinity. You have 1 over 2 roots of x, and then the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Okay, uh, so here let's just kind of regroup it. So limit as x is going towards infinity. Uh, do your sandwich trick. That's all going to go to the bottom. So I have 2 e to the x root of x, and then I just have a 1 on the top. I know I'm about to get an answer because the top is a number. And remember, when, when one of the layers, either the top or the bottom, and one of them's a number, you're about to get an answer. Here you'd end up getting uh, 1 over infinity, so this limit is going to end up being 0. Okay, so, so that one, if I have a 0 times infinity, which you really won't see very often, I don't think you'd see it on the AP exam, you could potentially see it in future math classes, uh, but the strategy for this would be to rewrite it, uh, as not rewrite it, just rewrite it, uh, just rewrite it as division. Can't do L'Hopital's rule unless it's division. So you take the multiplication and rewrite it as division, right? Okay, let's look at the next one, which would be the infinity minus infinity case. Let's see, I did that in green. Here we go. If I tried to plug it in, you get 1 over ln of 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1. So you got like 1 over 0 minus 1 over 0. Okay, so that's my infinity minus infinity case, right? 1 over 0 as that denominator, right? That's not exactly 0. That's just getting really, really, really close to 0. And so this is the infinity minus infinity case. And the strategy for this is just going to be, let me move that, it's just going to be to combine your fractions, right? Just do some algebra, combine the fractions. That says fractions, or at least it's supposed to. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to just do my fast adding trick. I'm still going to have the limit as x is approaching 1 from the right. Uh, and then let's just do my fast adding trick. So I'm going to cross multiply. To get the top, and then you can multiply across to get the bottom. All right, so we've combined those fractions. Uh, now, if I were to try to direct evaluate, you'd have 1 minus 1 minus ln of 1, so that's all going to be 0 on the top, and then you'd have ln of 1, which is 0, times 1 minus 1, so 0 times 0. Okay, so now that I've rewritten it, I will have a 0 over 0. Right, so that's nice because now I can use L'Hopital's rule, right? Therefore, let's use L'Hopital's rule for it. Now, before I, I guess you could distribute uh, and, and then take the derivative, which, uh, or you could take the derivative now. I mean, it, I don't really think it matters. Uh, let's just take the, let's just take the derivative now. Okay, that, that was terrible, smart board, come on. So let's go for it. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of negative 1 is 0. The derivative of ln is 1 over x. 
And then we have a product in the denominator. So that's a little bit annoying, but that's okay. We have the derivative of the first times the second uh, plus the derivative of the second, that's just one, times the first. Okay, so I had to do product rule, but we should know how to do that. Uh, let's take this and let's distribute. 1 over x times x, that's 1, and then 1 times the, 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 the 1 over x. Okay, so I'm going to just rewrite that. It's going to be 1 minus 1 over x. Sometimes the smart board's nice. So we'll get out of there. It's 1 minus 1 over x. So I've taken the derivative. That's what I got. If I tried to evaluate, I'd get 1 minus 1. So I'm going to get 0 on the top. 1 minus 1 plus uh, ln of 1. Okay, so I've still got 0 over a 0. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to use L'Hopital's rule again. All right, let's just take the derivative uh, again and let's see what happens. I guess I'm going to pick it up here. Limit as x is approaching 1 from the right. The derivative of 1 is 0. And then if I have, let me do it over here. If I have negative 1 over x, that's negative x to the negative first. So then this would multiply to the front. It's going to be positive x to the negative second power. So that derivative is going to be 1 over x squared. Right? The derivative of this is going to be 1 over x squared. Just a power rule. The derivative of 1 is 0, but then I have the 1 over x squared. And then the derivative of this one is 0, but then plus 1 over x squared. The derivative of ln is 1 over x. So I took the derivative again, and now I'm going to get an answer. All right, now if I plug in 1, I'm going to get 1 over 1 plus 1. So I'm going to get that, that 1 half. And if you remember back to when we did that, that first page, when we did one of the examples, when we just kind of plugged and chugged uh, one of the answers, right, specifically to this. I think it was the second example that first page, uh, we ended up getting one half. Okay, but now the moment you've all been waiting for, right? How do we deal with those uglier ones? We know how we can do, uh, let, me, let me get something like this. Uh, we know how to do those. Just combine uh, or just rewrite the multiplication as division. It's not terrible. It's annoying, but it's not terrible. Uh, we also know how to deal with that, right? We're just going to combine the fractions, use the L'Hopital's rule until you're, until you're good. But how do we deal with these other three, like these nastier three? Uh, well, it's going to be a little bit tricky. And so let's, let's go through. We're going to do this one example on the next page. It's going to be a little bit hard. I'm going to go through it fast because ultimately it's not critically important for your success this year. You probably won't even really see it a whole lot next year or in your future. But I'm going to show you the strategy for you, uh, or I'm going to show you the strategy just in case you're curious uh, you, and you want to know how to do it. I'm going to show you. At the end of the day, if you're just going to tune out, you're going to stop watching the video. It's really not the end of the world uh, if you don't know this last one. All right, but here we go. Let me try to uh, not just, here we go. So we have these other uh, indeterminate forms, which I guess I should just do it in blue since I'm color coding everything. Uh, we had those other indeterminate forms that were 0 to the 0, 1 to the infinity, and then it was uh, infinity to the 0 power. What's the strategy for those? All right, well, since those are all kind of exponential-ish, right? So they're not exponentials because you're going to have variables in both the base and the exponents. But it's going to be kind of similar to something we saw back when we did the exponentials. And it's, it's going to be similar to that thing that we saw called logarithmic differentiation, where I took a natural log at the beginning uh, because that, that enabled me to kind of work with some stuff and eventually get an answer. This is going to be a little bit confusing, but hopefully, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. All right, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to call all this stuff, I'm going to just call that y. So remember, the goal, right, what we want at the end of this question is we want to take the limit as x approaches infinity uh, of y. Right? This whole thing is y, and we want to take the limit as x approaches infinity of y. But we're going to do some scratch work over here. Right, y equals uh, 1 plus 2 over x to the x. We're going to do some scratch work. Remember our goal is to take the limit as, as x approaches infinity of y. But I'm going to need to take a natural log first. I don't know why that didn't pick up. Okay, there it goes. It just looks terrible. Uh, nope, go away. We're going to take a natural log. So I'm going to have ln of y, and that's going to be equal to x times ln 
over 1 plus 2x. Remember, if I take a natural log, it's kind of nice because it's going to enable me to bring that x out of the exponent, right? This, uh, that, once you take a natural log, is going to be able to come down to the front. So I've taken a natural log, and now this is what we're going to work with. We're now going to take the limit as x approaches infinity, but what we're working with is ln of y. Remember, the goal is just to have y, but we're going to be working with ln of y. So we're going to have to account for that later. We put in this natural log because it's going to enable us to do the work. We're going to have to take it back out later. All right, well, well, let's take the limit as x approaches infinity of this stuff, which is ln of y. So x times ln of 1 plus 2 over x. Remember, that's ln of y. We're taking the limit of it. Eventually, we'll have to deal with the fact that it was ln instead of just y. If I tried to plug this in, you're going to get infinity times plus 2 over infinity would be 0. Uh, 1 plus 0 is 1. ln of 1 is 0. Okay, so that's 0 times infinity. Gross. Don't like it. Uh, let's combine it and let's rewrite it. So here what I'm going to do is take the limit as x is approaching infinity, and I'm going to, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to put it on the bottom. So I'm going to have ln of 1 plus 2 over x, and I'm going to have uh, 1 over x on the bottom. Instead of, instead of multiplying by x, I'm going to divide by 1 over x, which is the same thing. Okay, multiplying uh, is the same thing as dividing by a reciprocal. Okay, now if I tried to check it, I would have that same, uh, if I tried to plug it in, right, 2 over infinity is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, ln of 1, so that's 0, but now 1 over infinity, that's 0. So now that is L'Hopital eligible, right? Now I'm able to take L'Hopital's rule because it's one of the nicer indeterminate forms. Okay, before I take L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to do a little bit. Right? And really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to combine this stuff. So I'm going to do a little bit of scratch work. I'm going to combine that stuff inside the log uh, before I take the derivative. And I'm actually going to use some log properties to then split it up. But I'm going to do some algebra work with this. 1 plus 2 over x. Uh, that's the same thing, right? So that's 1 over 1. Uh, okay, but I just, I'm going I'm to redo it because it's just ugly. Uh, it hurts my soul. Okay, so I've got 1 plus 2 over x which you could rewrite the 1 as 1 over 1. Let's do our fast adding trick. So cross multiply to get the top, multiply across to get the bottom. Okay, so I've got right now ln, and instead of this stuff, I've got x plus 2 over x. Right? That, that stuff inside, right here, you could rewrite it. Uh, I'm not going to stop there, though. I'm actually going to take this and split it up. I'm going to have ln of x plus 2 minus ln of x. Okay, so we know that it's eligible to be done with L'Hopital's rule. I've just kind of fiddled with how it looks a little bit because it's going to make my, my life of taking the derivative and simplifying it a little bit easier. You could just take the derivative with how it started, but then you're going to get bogged down in some harder algebra later. So I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a shortcut. I'm going to do the algebra first. Uh, because it's going to make it's going to make my calculus life and my ensuing algebra later. Right? Putting in the algebra work now, and it's going to help me and not do as much later. So let us use L'Hopital's rule. Now we're eligible to. Let's now use it. I, I did some finagling. I, I rearranged that stuff inside first. Uh, but now let's let's actually apply L'Hopital's rule. We still have the limit as x is approaching infinity. The derivative of that would be one over x plus two. The derivative of ln would just be 1 over x. The derivative of the bottom is going to be negative 1 over x squared. Okay, so we've got this stuff. Uh, now let's, let's do some more algebra scratch work. Uh, here, let's see. I'm going to actually erase all of this stuff. Uh, that was just algebra scratch work, and now I'm going to do some more algebra scratch work. I'm going to take all of this stuff, and I'm going to combine it. And I'm going to combine it all to just one fraction. So here, I'm going to combine the top first. So 1 over x plus 2 minus 1 over x. Really what I'm doing is I'm simplifying that, right? I'm combining that stuff. So here we go. Cross multiply to get the top. Multiply across to get the bottom. This negative would distribute. Ooh, that was really bad. Come on, Steve. That negative would distribute. So I have x minus x minus 2. The x's will cancel. So all of this stuff, when you combine it, will end up just being negative 2 over x, x plus 2. 
Okay, so that's what all that stuff in the circle uh, is. And then I have divided by, I have negative one over x squared. Now I'll do my sandwich trick, right? The middle two layers are gonna go to the bottom. The outside two layers are gonna go to the top. And then I'm gonna reduce it. I have an x that will cancel. I'm oh, sorry, I have a, a negative that will cancel. Uh, I also have an x that will cancel. And so I've got two x over x plus two. Okay, that's what all of this stuff, right? All the stuff inside this little box, that's what it all simplified into. So I'm just gonna rewrite it. I have the limit as x is approaching infinity, but all that stuff, right, uh, that all combined and I have 2x over x plus 2. That was a lot of algebra, kind of to detour. Uh, but now, now we've got something that looks pretty easy. Uh, if I were to take the derivative to get infinity over infinity, you could use L'Hopital's rule again, or if you just remember your horizontal asymptote rules, the limit for this is going to be 2. Right? You could technically use L'Hopital's rule one more time, or since it's a limit to infinity, focus on the big term on the top, the big term on the bottom, the x's cancel, right? From this point, we should be able to, right? You could do more work, but I'm not going to, right? You should be able to then finish it and figure out, hey, that's that's two. Okay, so what, what have we found so far? We got two, but remember, that was all for ln of y. So I know uh, the limit as x is approaching infinity of ln of y is two. But, but that's not really what I wanted to end with. What I wanted was the limit of just y. We had to put that natural log in because it enables us to kind of do everything. There's a ton of algebra kind of on the scratch to help us, on the side to help us. Uh, but, but I put that log in, so to be fair, I'm gonna have to take it back out. So the limit as x is approaching infinity of just y, right? How would I undo a natural log? Well, I would exponentiate. So the limit of y, right, if, I, if ln of y is going to be 2, uh, then, then the limit of just the y is going to be e squared. And that's what we wanted, right? Uh, that was actually that really weird 7.38 whatever, whatever, whatever decimal. That was the third example uh, that we did on the first page, right? So this process, right, uh, how, how we go ahead and, and answer these nastier indeterminate forms is you have to use that log, right? You have to use logs, and there's a, there's a ton of algebra that goes with those. Those are mean, hard questions, right? Kind of like logarithmic differentiation. Taking a log sometimes is necessary for you uh, before you can do everything else. Uh, but you, you really won't see those very often. They're a little bit hard. But taking a log is nice. Anytime you see variables in the base and in the exponent, your technique is probably going to be take a natural log, and then do whatever you need to do. If that's to take a derivative afterwards, so be it, logarithmic differentiation. If that's to eventually take a limit, so be it. It's like logarithmic, I don't know, limitation. I just made that up. I don't know, maybe we can make it a thing. But taking a log is really how we can deal with variables in both of the base and in the exponent. Okay, so uh, L'Hopital's rule, let's just summarize it, right? The big important stuff. Those non, uh, or those weirder indeterminate forms, actually I can just, I don't need everything, I'm just going to get rid of it all. Uh, the, the, there's two, there's really seven indeterminate forms. We have zero over zero, infinity over infinity. Really, really like those two, uh, because those are my L'Hopital rule. We have the other ones, zero times infinity, uh, then we have infinity minus infinity, and then we have what, one to the infinity power, zero to the zero power, and then I think, I always forget this last one infinity to the zero power. We have strategies to deal with all of those, right? It was to rewrite as division. Uh, for this one, it was to combine fractions. And then the strategy for all of those was to basically use natural logs, right? And that, that had a ton of algebra. Uh, these kind of nastier ones, we really don't see very often. AP exam is going to give you stuff like this. And L'Hopital's rule is a really nice rule. Uh, whatever your limit is, right, your limit as x approaches, I don't know, in, uh, whatever I have, f of x over g of x, L'Hopital's rule says, hey, if that gives me one of those two indeterminate forms, uh, then I could just take the limit 
it would be that same exact limit, but it would be the limit of the derivatives instead. You don't have to do quotient rule. It's easier. The derivative on the top stays on the top. The derivative on the bottom stays on the bottom. No quotient rule. Just take the two derivatives, and then that limit of the ratio of the derivatives will give you the same thing as the limit. And you just keep using L'Hopital's rule as many times as you need to until either the top is the number or the bottom is a number. Right? And as soon as one of the layers or both of the layers is the number, you're going to get your answer. L'Hopital's rule, though, really makes all of those algebraic techniques, like conjugates, like combining and simplifying, like fractions, uh, like all that stuff, factoring, reducing, all that stuff, even, even the ones like sine x over x, uh, which as x goes to zero, right, that limit was, uh, ooh, that limit wasn't zero, that limit was one, uh, or one minus cosine x over x, as x goes to, to zero, that one was zero, right, even those special trig ones, hope he told you it works, all of the stuff that we basically see with limits, as long as you get zero over zero or infinity over infinity, Lopital's rule is the one calculus rule that will kind of cover everything. And it's a really nice, really easy one.